Let's say that you've finished a couple of computer science classes, you know the basics of programming, you know if statements, you know loops, you know how to build objects. You probably are capable of solving a lot of different kinds of problems. And I remember when I was in college, I thought once I learned that stuff, it was pretty much downhill from here. It was just applying it in different ways. But it turns out that Computers are pretty capable of solving a lot of problems, but when you get into bigger challenges with data, you have to really think about how you're going to structure your data, how you're going to retrieve it. And that's really where this kind of information comes in. Data structures is all about how do we efficiently store and retrieve data. Uh, if you're a carpenter, you need to learn how to use a lot of different tools to be a really good carpenter, just like a software engineer has to learn how to use a lot of really different tools to be an effective software engineer. So at the end of the day, this is all about trade-offs. Trade-offs basically mean we can't do everything. So if we think about computers today, they're pretty fast and they're pretty capable. You can do a lot of different things pretty quickly. Uh, you've got a lot of memory on your computer. You've probably got pretty decent processor speed. Uh, you've got a lot of internet bandwidth more than likely. Uh, so all of these things are true. Computing capacity is higher than ever before. But all of these resources are going to have their limits. We don't have unlimited memory. We have a lot of memory, but we don't have unlimited memory. Uh, we have a lot of processor speed, but they're not instantaneous. So we have to really consider how we're going to use these resources at our disposal. Really what a lot of trade-offs come down to are, are trade-offs in time and space. When we talk about time, we're talking about the amount of processor time, amount, the number of cycles it really takes to solve a problem, and the amount of space, the amount of memory that we have to use in order to solve that problem. So most solutions uh, are going to go pretty well if we have infinite memory, uh, and most solutions will also go pretty well if we have infinite time, but Unfortunately, we're constrained on both of those. We're going to have a certain processor speed so that if we want to solve a problem, it's going to take some time. And we're going to have a certain amount of memory so we can't store data forever. Uh, we could probably store things on disk. You know, we can back things up there, but that gets kind of slow. Then we're kind of still trading things off because accessing a disk is slower than accessing data in memory and so on and so on. So a lot of our, our solutions are going to come down to this trade-off in time versus space. Uh, data structures is mostly a study in trade-offs. More or less, there's, there's really not a perfect data structure. There are certain data structures we can use to solve certain problems, uh, and they're going to do that really, really well. You know, a, a tree, when we try to store a lot of random data, is going to perform pretty well. But if we try to store sorted data in a tree, it's not going to perform quite as well. Uh, just like if we have a hash table, it's going to store information pretty effectively. But if we have to retrieve it in a way that uh, there's a lot of similar data that's going to come up with the same kind of uh, location in a hash table, it's not going to work super well well. So we really have to choose the right data structures to perform the right tasks here. There's not really a one-size-fits-all data structure. Each one is good for different things. So one of the ways we measure this is with Big O. Big O is really a measure of performance. It's not exact. It's not meant to tell you exactly how much time something's going to run in. That really wouldn't be useful anyway because there are so many different processor configurations, so many different system configurations that exact measurements probably wouldn't mean much day to day. Uh, really, it conveys your performance as a basic and simple reduced function. So we usually convey Big O as Big O of N or Big O of constant time or Big O of 1, we might say. Big O of log N or Big O of N squared. You can also have Big O of N cubed. You could have big O of n factorial, big O of n to the n. I mean, there are a lot of different ways we can convey things. And uh, problems that are very, very large sometimes don't have really, really fast solutions in any case. So sometimes big O of n factorial is the best we can do. Uh, sometimes big O of, you know, 2 to the nth power is the best we can do. And those, those solutions tend to re be, re require smaller solution sizes or they tend to require a lot of processing power. Uh, when we break this down, more or less what we mean is that big O of n means that performance is a function of the number of things we're working with. So uh, if we have 10 things and we're trying to solve a problem, we would expect that solving the problem for 100 things would be 10 times bigger. Uh, more or less, we are trying to convey our capability to perform our, our, our process as uh, some kind of function of how many things we're working with. And like I said, it's not exact, so it may not be, you know, 100 things may not be 10 times the, the amount of time it takes to process 10 things. It may be 
I don't know, eight times or 8.5 times. Uh, this becomes more and more important as the data we get, work with gets larger and larger. Because if we're dealing with a billion things, then a big O of n cubed algorithm probably isn't going to be useful in any time that we can we can really uh, apply it. Uh, so when we get into very large data, we want to try to find the most optimal algorithms and most optimal data structures we can use to interact with that data. Uh, big O of 1 or big O of constant time means that performance is constant. It doesn't matter. If we're solving this problem for one thing or a billion things, it doesn't matter. It's always going to perform exactly the same. And we love those kinds of solutions because they allow us to kind of use those data structures for free when it comes to, it comes to processing. It doesn't necessarily mean that we get that time for free based on memory. Sometimes to achieve big O of 1, we need to use uh, a lot of memory. And again, remember that's constrained, so we have to think about that as well. Uh, we use big O to evaluate how good a data structure is or an algorithm is at a particular task. So big O of 1 is great. It means that our performance is always going to be the same. Big O of log n is also pretty good. It means that our performance is going to be reasonable no matter how many things we're working with. If we're looking at 100 things, or we're looking at, uh, you know, our performance is going to be reasonable. If we're looking at 1,000 things, our performance is not going to be that much worse. Uh, and big O of n means that the performance scales with the size of the problem. So if we don't have to do a big O of n task over and over again, most likely it's okay. I mean, if you think about it, your processor is probably about two gigahertz these days, maybe one and a half gigahertz, but somewhere in the space of being able to run over a billion cycles a second. So if we have to process a million things and we have a big O of n algorithm, that probably can still perform reasonably well if we don't have to do it over and over again. So Let's take a, a straightforward example here. So we're going to take a look at binary search and kind of look at the way it runs and try to analyze how long it's going to take. So if we look at a big O example of binary search, we're going to take this, we've got a list of 15 randomly generated numbers. They're in sorted order, but let's take a look at this list. 1, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 11, 15, 18, 19, 20, 24, 26, 33, 36, 39. So they're in order, and when we have a set of data that's in, or a list of data that's in order, uh, we can try to determine where something is. So the straightforward way to find something, you know, is to... The, kind of the brute force solution here is uh, to look at the first item, then look at the second item, then look at the third item, but that's not terribly efficient. Uh, if we want to find a more efficient algorithm, what we can do is, since the data is sorted, we can look at the thing in the middle. So in this case, we're looking at 15 at index 7 in this array, and we can identify, we can kind of figure out, is the thing that we're looking for bigger or smaller than this? So let's, let's look at the middle value here. Uh, at index 7, we have the value 15. If we're trying to find 10, we can say, well, is 15 10? No, it's not. So if 15 is greater than 10, then we need to go to the left side because 10 is going to be on, a, on the smaller side of this value. And if 15 is less than 10, then we have to go to the right side because 10 is going to be on, uh, larger than the value we're looking at. Uh, here we can see that you know 10 is less than 15, so we have to look at this smaller set of data or smaller number of values. So we're going to go to the left side, and then we're left with a smaller subarray here: 1, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 11. So if we look at that, we can find the new middle value here, which is going to be 5, and we apply the same technique. 5 is less than 10, so we have to go to the right. So we're left now with this smaller set of values, 8, 9, 11. So the new middle value is 9. We compared these. 9 is less than 10, so we go right again, and uh, we compare 11 and 10, but we're all out of options. We can't go anywhere. We've kind of exhausted everything we can do here. So we found an answer. 10 isn't in the list, but it didn't take that many comparisons. Now, we're not looking at a huge amount of data here, but it only took a handful of comparisons to try to figure out where we are here. So 15 is greater than 10, 5 is less than 10, 9 is greater, less than 10, and 11 is greater than 10. So we only made four comparisons to determine how whether or not this is in the list. So if we break this down, you know, if we want to try to think about logarithms, and I know logarithms can be confusing sometimes, basically what we're trying to find out is, in this case, log base 2 of what or you know of what ends up to be 16 so if we look at 2 to the 4th power that's 16 right 2 to the 4th power 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 that means log base 2 of 16 is 4 so we're just kind of reversing that exponent or exponent there uh, we'll find that binary search takes about log base 2 comparisons at most therefore binary search is 
big O of log n. Now if we try this on a larger set of data, we can see that this is still going to hold up. If we take a look at 31 numbers here, so we have a list of 31 numbers, 1, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 11, 15, 18, 19, 20, 24, 26, 33, 39, 45, 47, and so on. Uh, if we try to find 84 in this list of numbers, and it's all sorted, so we can apply binary search, we look at the middle, and we say 45 is less than 84, and then 70 is less than 84, and then 82 is less than 84, then 94 is greater than 84, but then we find it all the way out there at the end. So that took five comparisons. And if we think about this, five comparisons is about log uh, base 2 of 32. So that gives us, you know, 2 to the fifth power is going to be 32. So, and if we keep increasing the amount of data that we apply to this, you know, 63, 127, 255, all the way up to uh, literally billions of values, we're going to find that we kind of scale pretty well with our solutions here. It's only going to take 30 comparisons to apply binary search to a list of a billion values. So big O of log n is really good. It gives us this ability to find things really effectively or solve problems really quickly. Uh, and you can kind of see how this all breaks down here. Now, an interesting thing to note is that when we get into our 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, comparisons, uh, log base 2 of 1, 000, about 1,000 is 10, log base 2 of about 1 million is 20, and log base 2 of about a billion is 30. We can keep expanding that. Log base 2 of about a trillion is going to be 40. So there's this nice coincidental relationship where uh, log base 2 of, you know, 10 to the third power or 10 to the sixth power adds up to about 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, 50. And this is a really good tool to use when you have to estimate how long something's going to take or what the how the powers of two are going to work at much larger values. It also helps us to calculate kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, uh, and, and kind of establish that relationship effectively as well. Just a nice little trick. So if we take an, a look at a different kind of algorithm, a less effective algorithm, the sequential search, if we don't have sorted data, we don't really have a better way to solve this problem. So if we have a bunch of unsorted data and we need to find something in it, but we only need to do it once, then really all we can do is use this sequential search. So if we have this big list of data here, how do we find a number? How do we find 7 or 88 or 22? Well, you know, we could sort it first, which would take some time, but if we only have to do this once, it's actually going to be more effective to just find the thing. And the only way we can do it is to look at things one by one, look at each value one by one. So the performance isn't going to be as good as we had with binary search. If we try to find the value 58, we can look at a couple of values, you know, we look at 39, 35, 37, 8, and then we find 58. But if we're looking for a number that isn't there, we have to look at every single number in this particular list. So the work we have to do here is a function of how many values we need to look at. So we'll use n as that number of values, and that means that our sequential search is big O of n. So what we find is anytime we have to do a sequential search, we could get lucky and we could find the value we're looking for at the beginning, but chances are it's going to be somewhere in, in the middle on average. And uh, if we can't find the thing at all, we're going to have to look at every single value. So that's why we call this one a big O of n algorithm. It really depends on how many things we're looking at. You know, it depends directly on n. So the important topics from this particular discussion were talking about trade-offs and how we have to think about memory versus processing time. Big O and how we can evaluate how things perform. And then the three basic measurements of Big O that we'll look at right away. Big O of constant time, Big O of logarithmic time, and Big O of uh, linear time. Big O of 1, Big O of log n, and Big O of n. Uh, it's important to know all of these. You know, it's important to, to be able to kind of think and sort of reason through how you evaluate these. Uh, but if you start to learn these and start to understand these, you'll be really effective when you get into how to evaluate data structures. Thanks for listening.